Child actors don't just appear in kids' movies. Plenty of actors in their teens and younger have been in films of gruesome imagery or disturbing subject matter. And even if the filmmakers tried to shield them from seeing too much, it surely had an effect. The first thing 12-year-old Tim does in River's Edge is throw his sister's doll into a river. It's a mean-spirited act, but it perfectly underscores the world view of the small-town teens and director Tim Hunter's 1986 film. Their alienation manifests in ways from theft and drug use to cold-blooded killing. Tim is the youngest of the film's characters, but also the most casually immoral. By the end, Tim threatens to kill his own brother. You shouldn't have hit me. <sighs> Don't be stupid, Tim. Joshua John Miller, the son of playwright and actor Jason Miller, was just 12 years old when he replaced Corey Haim as Tim in River's Edge, and with only a handful of minor TV credits to his name. But he's totally convincing in carrying out Tim's list of cruelties, which includes stealing drug dealer Feck's gun and later assaulting him with it. Miller would play other kids on the edge, most notably in Near Dark, before transitioning to his current career as a writer and TV producer. But none were as chilling as Tim. The catalogue of cruelties perpetrated by Lena Klammer, a psychotic 33-year-old posing as an adolescent girl, isn't the most shocking element of 2009's Orphan. Lena kills multiple people, threatens other children, and attempts to seduce her adoptive father. But the really disturbing aspect of these incidents is that actress Isabella Furman was only 12 years old when the movie was made. Yet Furman was more than happy to explore the gory aspects of her character. As she told the Boston Herald in 2009, if America hates me, I've done my job. Furman doubled down on her astonishing performance in Orphan First Kill, a prequel released nine years after the previous film. Though 25 at the time, Furman gave another chillingly believable turn as a nine-year-old Lena with the help of body doubles, forced perspective, and makeup special effects, but no CGI. Director William Brent Bell told Showbiz Cheat Sheet, Sometimes I think the visual effects component of digital effects actually makes it look worse. In 13, Tracy Freeland, played by Evan Rachel Wood, is already close to emotional ground zero when she enters the seventh grade. Her divorced mom, Melanie, is a recovering alcoholic, and her body image problems have led to self-harming. When she meets popular girl Evie, played by co-writer Nikki Reed, her need for acceptance pushes her into rash acts, including shoplifting, drug use, and casual sex, that spiral into self-destructive behavior. Unfortunately, Tracy has only her fraught relationship with her mother as a support system. Director Catherine Hardwick and Reed, who later collaborated on the Twilight franchise, drew on Reed's own experiences when writing 13. Though Reed later admitted that she exaggerated some of her experiences in the script, the anxiety and confusion of being a teen girl rings true in much of the film. Wood and Reed, who were 16 and 15, respectively at the time of filming, were strictly monitored by Hardwick, their own mothers, and a child welfare worker during their most difficult scenes to ensure their emotional well-being. In a 2015 interview with the late Anne H. and Heather Duffy for their podcast Better Together with Anne and Heather, actress Mariel Hemingway said audiences would never see her Oscar-nominated breakout role in Woody Allen's 1979 comedy Manhattan if the movie was released in the current film market. And I'm not condoning any behavior. I'm talking about that movie. But that movie probably couldn't come out today. Why? For one, the film features a romantic relationship between a 42-year-old writer, played by Alan, and Hemingway's 17-year-old student. While that scenario might have been offbeat but acceptable in 1979 today, it reads as an older man's creepy manipulation of a young girl. Another reason is the accusations by Alan's adoptive daughter, Dylan Faro, who alleged that he sexually abused her when she was just seven years old. It's very difficult to keep that out of mind while watching Alan Canoodle with the teenage Hemingway. But even the most forgiving viewer must know that the cultural landscape has changed, and that an adult with a teenager under 18 is inappropriate. Femme fatales have been a Hollywood trope since the days of silent films, but the stereotype takes an exploitative turn when the dangerous woman in question is a teenager. The 1992 movie Poison Ivy aims for a cross between film noir and fatal attraction in its story of a sexually free but homicidally inclined teen. The casting of Drew Barrymore, then in a career rebound after struggles with drug addiction, and name players like Sarah Gilbert and Tom Skerritt attempted to lend respectability to the sleazy role. Barrymore, then 17, isn't particularly convincing at depicting Ivy, a deranged teen so taken with Gilbert's normal life that she's willing to seduce her father and kill her mother. The character is aware of her desirability, but unable to use it for anything except base interests. Barrymore gamely handles the story's most prurient aspects. 
which include making out with the 17-year-old Gilbert and 60-year-old Skerritt and pushing Cheryl Ladd off a balcony. The 1998 film adaptation of Stephen King's novella, Apt Pupil, differs from its source material, but the film retains its disturbing portrait of evil's corrupting influence. The late Brad Renfro stars as Todd, a teenager who discovers that his elderly neighbor, Kurt Dusander, played by Ian McKellen, is a former Nazi. The team blackmails Dusander into telling grisly stories from concentration camps. Their relationship warps both men in dangerous ways. Todd blackmails his guidance counselor, while Kurt starts killing transients. But though some of the grisier elements of King's story are toned down for the movie, many are featured in Brandon Boyce's script. For Renfro, who was 17 years old during production, that meant participating in scenes where Todd helped kill a homeless man and a fantasy sequence in which he envisions his classmates as concentration camp prisoners, which prompted a lawsuit against director Brian Singer for infliction of emotional distress and other charges. Todd's corrupted innocence was familiar to Renfro throughout his acting career in films including The Client, and tragically in his own life off-camera, which ended with his 2008 death from a drug overdose at the age of 25. Peter Kartla was just 11 years old when he was cast in Czech director Václav Mahal's 2019 adaptation, Jerzy Kaczynski's novel The Painted Bird. He couldn't have picked a more harrowing story for his debut. The movie follows a mostly silent boy wandering through a surreal housecape in Eastern Europe during the early days of World War II. The boy is brutalized, beaten, sexually assaulted, and tortured, and witnesses horrific behavior by every adult he meets. Kartler had never acted on film before, but holds his own in scenes opposite Stellan Skarsgård, Harvey Keitel, and the late Julian Sands. In an interview with The Guardian, Mahal said he shielded Kartler from the most traumatizing scenes by capturing his reactions separately from the action. He also relied on Kartler's family and a full-time assistant to provide him with emotional support when it was needed. Despite their protection, the experience seems to have impacted Kartler, Mahal said, after he told me he doesn't want to be an actor. Alicia Silverstone made her big-screen debut in The Crush, a supremely icky thriller that cast a 17-year-old actress as a 14-year-old lethal Lolita with designs on a 28-year-old journalist played by Carrie Elwells. The film, directed by TV vet Alan Shapiro, plays on familiar sexist tropes about teenage girls and the clueless adult men who fall for them. I'll always be a friend, no matter what, okay? Okay. Like that night up at the lighthouse when we kissed? Elwes's character steps into every snare laid by Silverstone, and then experiences a moment of crisis about her age, which is supposed to generate sympathy when she unleashes a torment of psychotic behavior on him. The crush portrays Silverstone as a contemptible object, while also fetishizing her sexuality. As the film's villain, she's given all sorts of outlandish schemes to carry out. She nearly kills Elwes's new girlfriend and pins a charge of sexual assault on him. At the same time, the film also affirms that it's okay to enjoy the camera ogling a supposed 14-year-old at every turn. The Washington Post review summed up the film's have-it-both-ways approach by noting, There's something scuzzy about the whole exercise. Guillermo del Toro is a passionate advocate of writer-director Issa Lopez's 2017 Mexican film Tigers Are Not Afraid, which is both a haunting supernatural thriller and a melancholy look at the impact of drug violence. But as with del Toro's films like The Devil's Backbone and Pan's Labyrinth, Tigers Are Not Afraid is also about the terrors and traumas of childhood, and how some children learn to survive them while others do not. To deliver that gut punch, Lopez worked with an extraordinary group of young actors and put them through an emotional workout, though it was carefully guided. The young actors in Tigers Are Not Afraid play residents of an unnamed Mexican city ravaged by drug lords. The children lose virtually everything – parents, homes, even mementos – and death is around them at all times. Bodies line the streets, adults and children are killed violently in front of them, and children are forced to fight and even kill in return. Ghosts are also a constant presence, urging revenge for their deaths. Director Scott Derrickson's thriller The Black Phone is so briskly paced that viewers might almost miss the storyline's truly horrible elements. An adaptation of a short story by Joe Hill, the film focuses on Finney, played by Mason Thames, a teenager who has been abducted by a child murderer known as The Grabber. Though terrified, Finney begins to receive visions and messages from the grabber's deceased victims and formulates an escape plan. Finney's communication with the victims is so otherworldly that it's almost easy to forget these kids have died in particularly tragic ways. They were stolen off the streets of their hometowns and tormented by a sadistic mass killer, who eventually took their lives in a way that undoubtedly really hurts, as the grabber puts it. The unendurable sadness of Finney's fate and their deaths is felt in the emotional line readings by Thames. 
who was 14 when the film was released in 2021, and his young castmates. In 2015's Goodnight Mommy, a woman returns to her isolated home after surgery, where twin sons greet her. At least they believe she's their mother, but her angry, often violent reactions to them cause the boys to suspect otherwise. They hold her captive in increasingly cruel ways to extract a confession from her. But what they eventually discover is far more complicated and chilling than a simple imposter situation. Adding considerably to the creepiness of this Austrian film is that two young boys play the twins. Elias and Lucas Schwartz, who, according to various sources, were 12 while filming, carry out many unsettling acts. They raise huge cockroaches and look after a dead cat, and eventually tie down and seal their alleged mother's mouth shut to prevent her from screaming for help. When she refuses to change her story, the boys glue her to the floor and set the house ablaze. By that point, it's far too late for anyone to change their story. Michael Haneke's 1997 film Funny Games is a polarizing experience. You are either wowed by the movie's deliberate manipulation to produce maximum horror or completely disgusted by its catalog of sadism. The brutality two strangers bring upon an Austrian family is painful to watch, and the torment seems of no point beyond amusing the culprits. The family's son, Shoshi, suffers some of the worst abuse. Not only does he witness his parents' torture, but he also stumbles upon the corpse of his neighbor's daughter in an attempt to flee. The boy, played by German actor Stefan Klapczynski, who was only 11 at the time of filming, is also featured in one of the film's most infamous scenes, when he's mercilessly shot by one of the strangers. The on-screen death of a child is upsetting for audiences, but when accompanied by so much other awful behavior, it's an almost unbearable experience.